check out ESPN Film's newly released 30 for 30 podcasts. From the producers of our award-winning documentary series, this is an amazing collection of sports stories you need to hear to believe. Speaking of amazing, Delta Airlines and the Fly Delta app make your travel experience amazingly easy with real-time bag tracking, e-boarding, and passport scanning during check-in. And don't forget to download 30 for 30 podcasts to fill your flight with stories that will keep you coming back for more. Welcome to the Right Time Podcast. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. It is the Bomani Jones Show on ESPN Radio. Everyone relax. That voice you hear, that's right. It's not Bomani. Everybody's panicked. Will, 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 can you come in? Bomani's locked out. He's locked out. He can't get into the studio. He just he just ran to the head and the security guard left. He can't get in. I was like, man, Shannon, <laughs> ain't nobody that wants to hear my voice leading off this show. There ain't... This is the worst scenario you can imagine. Day whoa, what the hell's going on? Whoa, what the hell's going on here? What is, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I see what you just got back. Here? Hey, 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 what just happened here, Will? Did you just scare the hell out of all my peoples? Yes. Can you imagine the day that you're locked out is the day that Michael Bennett takes a seat, the day where you're, you're on the air first after Charlottesville, a year after this Colin Kaepernick guys have guest hosted for you. Couldn't be a worse scenario. Yeah, that's what I say. Just like the, the day I go on vacation, the day the Kaepernick thing happens, you almost set fire to my whole damn show. <laughs> and here we are a year later about to do it again until you get back in the studio. Yes, yes. The one thing I do want to know, and that is Will Kate, I have Bomani Jones, all that fun stuff. Um, we're presented by Progressive Insurance. Uh, send us tweet, 1-800-Flowers.com, Twitter feed, at Bomani underscore Jones. I like you a great deal. Like, I met you a couple of times, and I came away like, I really like Will a lot. He's just wrong all the time. <laughs> all right, I guess. You need people wrong in your life so you can be right, right? That's how I look at it. That's how I look at you. <laughs> but, I think that's, you know, but I think that's an important distinction to make on this, especially at times as these, although I have no idea what you said about Charlottesville, and I'm somewhat scared to ask. But I do, I, I do like you a great deal. I figure since we were both here at the same time, I would say that to America before I take my show back, before you burn it down. <laughs> well, I appreciate that because you hadn't said it to me before, so now oh, I know too. <laughs> my bad. I thought you knew. I always remember this. People I don't like, I just don't talk to. Well, look at this. Everybody walks through the, the hallways, and you know how this is, and they smile at you and tell you did a good show, and they shake your hand, but you don't know really what they're thinking. No, 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 that's true, and be clear. I never told you I thought you did a good show. So me, <laughs> telling, you, so me telling you that I like you is definitely a thing. But, but, man, thank you so much for being here to save the day as the day almost needed saving. you got to be nice to me, otherwise you get locked out, tech going to the head again. You never know what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, you, you, i got to figure out what I'm going to do the next time. All so, right, my see man, you, man. Thank you now. Uh, 888-729-3776, that is our telephone number. Yes, guys, I've been gone for a while. I am back. I'm not going to be here Thursday. But for now, um, I am back. I am exhausted. I am tired. I am beat down. I've been doing all this traveling. And, of course, me being exhausted and beat down falls in line with us having wonderful topics to discuss that are probably not a whole lot of fun. So like, people hit me up like, yo, man, we can't hear what you got to say. Can't wait to hear what you got to say about Charlottesville. What you got to say about Charlottesville? And then I came to work like, do I have to talk about Charlottesville? I'm just a little bit tired. Right? Like, I don't enjoy this. I don't enjoy any of this, and it's kind of a weird place to be in, and I guess you can make the argument I position myself to be in this place as it comes, but, like, I don't I don't enjoy this. I don't enjoy going down that road. It winds up being exhausting, and, of course, the part that winds up being exhausting is things that are matters of right and wrong. This isn't, like, it is one, right? Like, I think there's very clear right. I think there's very clear wrong. I'm not in the mood to debate with anybody about what right or wrong is on that. I'm just not. I'm I'm not there. Like so, I was at the NASA Association of Black Journalists uh, convention this weekend, and it was a presentation, and woman was talking about what was going on in Charlottesville, and like she was crying as she was talking. Now, at that moment, I wasn't like really fully aware of what the deal was. I just knew that there was you know the the protest that was going on. I wasn't up at that point on the fact that somebody had gotten hit with a car or anything like that. Like, I wasn't there. Like, I just watched a woman, and she was all broken down. And I was just kind of looking at it like I wasn't sure exactly what angle or what part of it had her broken down. Like, I'm not to be all, I'm Mr. I'm all for peaceful, peaceful protest, but, hey, man, a whole bunch of people like to get together and make all that noise if they want to. Like, that, that's kind of sort of how it goes, and I am of the sort that is inclined to vehemently defend their right to go ahead and do that. Um, I don't think there's anything else that I'm willing to defend about what went on there. I find like the whole point to be somewhat illogical. Um, I found a lot of the response from people who were somewhat important, at least, you know, according to title 
to be a bit disappointing, but I just saw that and I was like, yo, is this where we are? Like collectively, is this where we are? And to the point where I'm saying, is this where we are? I mean, are we at the point where these cats are showing up with no mask? Like what? Like that's the wildest part about this is, is not even so much the fact that people are willing to do this, it's the fact they're willing to do this so fearlessly. Like I remember when like the Black Lives Matter protests and stuff were coming up, people hit me like, yo, man, you going to go to them? I'm like, man, that place crawling with feds. You're going to be on a list messing around, hanging out there. And it's a matter of whether you want to do that or not. Yo, these cats ain't got no consideration for that. They're not worried about it at all. They out there with their faces on it. Like, I'm not going to lose my job or anything like that. It's like, yo, we had a point where people are willing to come out and ride for Nazi, bruh. They are riding for a Nazi. Like, psh, all right, then. I mean, that's got to scare you, right? Because that's the part about this is I looked at that and saw it on television, man. I ain't really at the point of being, like, outraged and all that. No, man, I think that there's grounds to legitimately be afraid. And the reason I say that there's grounds to be legitimately afraid is this ain't the end. This ain't the last one. Like, this is going on right here in Charlottesville, Virginia. People were getting on planes, trains, and automobiles to protest the removal of a statue in a town of 55,000 people. And people got on planes, trains, and automobiles behind that one. This is going to keep up for a little while because the people that wound up on the business end of this are not really people who are just inclined to be like, okay, you got me. No, man. Like, this right here is going to keep going and going to keep going and going to keep going. And everybody involved in it better figure out what the hell side they are. Now, the way that this comes into sports, because you guys like sports anchors when you get your real life involved, the way that this winds up coming back in sports is what you see with these cats with the National Anthem, right? Michael Bennett says he's not going to stand for the National Anthem. Um, His reasons were a bit more vague than Colin Kaepernick's were, but they were very similar. Marshawn Lynch did not stand for the National Anthem, and I really can't tell you why because he really ain't about to tell us why. He told Jack Del Rio that that's something that he's been doing for the last 11 years, and Jack Del Rio said, okay, I respect you as a man. I do wonder how Jack Del Rio would have approached this if Marshawn Lynch, who walks around wearing African medallions, and Shannon, what was that? Did he call the dude at the press conference in that press conference? He called a black man, and he called him African. It was one of those of the same circle, though. You remember that? To check which one, but it was one of the two. It was yeah. it was one of those, right? Like quietly, Marshawn Lynch has told you everything, except people kind of view him almost as a gesture of sorts, so they don't think about it. But Marshawn Lynch been letting you know how he feels about this for a while. It's been subtle, it's been on the low. But like you know anything about Oakland? Oakland got a, a got a Nelson Mandela Parkway, right? Like you know anything about Oakland? He's telling you what it is right there. Now. NFL can't do anything to those cats, man. They especially couldn't have done anything to those cats after the thing with Charlottesville happened. But the NFL can't do anything to those cats. And it's not just because of, like, the bright light that's on Kaepernick. It's the fact that after Kaepernick did that, the NFL sent that. I mean, all those teams sent it out and said, well, let players do whatever they want. Nobody got in trouble last year for taking a knee or anything that they chose to do during the national anthem. Nobody did. The league looked up and realized they had no rules against it. They realized they couldn't fight it. And so they wound up letting that sort of thing go. Do you think Michael Bennett and Marshawn Lynch are going to be the last to make this call? They do you think they are? Because what I'm saying on this is I'm not at this particular moment getting into the matters of right and wrong of this. But I will tell you the sentiments in the country that then have people showing up in Charlottesville with no mask acting up like they did. Those sorts of things are when people witness them on television or they kind of live in the midst of those things. What happens on the other side is a groundswell from uh, folks who are really stepping up, not in the name of anything other than dignity. Right. Like it really comes down to a matter of human dignity. Like I listen to something Michael Bennett's talking about, man. Those are primarily matters of dignity. You listen to what Kaepernick was talking about. That is a matter of dignity. Like after a certain point, there are going to be people who feel that it's necessary for them to stand in the name of their own dignity. Now, if we're going to be real about it, the cast is out here wilding in Charlottesville. A lot of them feel the exact same thing except what they consider to be their dignity goes so far beyond just the basic idea of what dignity is. Like, I just can't see how you that mad about taking down a statue of Robert E. Lee if you're not even from the South. Right? So the argument them cats are making over there is they feel as though white culture is being erased and... Like, like Robert, like if you take down a statue of Robert E. Lee, like they ain't a whole bunch of statues of other white men like all over the place. 
They see that as an affront to their own dignity. I think that they're being ridiculous, but I'm telling you, the response on the other side is always going to be for people to stand up, straighten up their backs, and fight for their dignity on the other end. And the NFL is full of a lot of dudes, typically guys that are in their 20s, maybe early 30s, but largely in their 20s. And this is when a lot of them become aware of the world that they live in. This is when a lot of them look around and say to themselves that I got this cash, I got whatever it is, but it don't mean that much if I don't have my dignity. And people got different steps that they're willing to take when it comes down to asserting their dignity to affirming that in front of everybody. But when I look at cats like Bennett and Lynch, what I see through this lens, through these experiences, and through my own understanding of the world past past and present, that is an assertion of human dignity. And I hope that people understand, man, that there's a lot of folks that's out here right now who are just kind of tired of having their dignity scoffed at. They're sick of it. And it's kind of hard to live in these times and look at who says what and who does not say what. And not feel as though your dignity is under some measure of assault. And the thing that should worry you is how much of this assault on dignity that people are being asked to endure is being done in the name of the American flag. Right now, you can say what the American flag stands for objectively. Okay, that's fine. I'm just telling you, man, when I go on the Internet and people start bucking bad with me, so many of them do it in the name of the American flag. And I see these cats that's out here with this Nazi stuff. They out here doing it in large part in the name of the American flag. Like we have in a lot of ways allowed the American flag to be co-opted by those who do not seem to buy into what at least the theoretical values are that are behind the American flag. So if you are mad at Colin Kaepernick for disrespecting the American flag or Marshawn Lynch or Michael Bennett, look at who the people are who wave that flag and put it in my face. And when I say my, I mean me. Go look who the people are that take that flag and that put it in my face when they tell me that my dignity doesn't matter. Those are the people disrespecting your flag a whole lot more than these people who won't stand for that anthem. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Michael Bennett did not stand for the national anthem um, over the weekend in the Seahawks uh, preseason game, and here he is explaining why he chose to do that. I think last week I was just, with everything that's been going on the last couple of months, and especially after the last couple of days, seeing everything in uh, Virginia, seeing what's going on out there, and we, Earlier today in Seattle, I just wanted to be able to use my platform to be able to continue to speak on injustice. First of all, I want to make sure people understand I love the military. I love my father was in the military. I love I love hot dogs like any other American. I love football like any other American. But I, I don't love segregation. I don't love riots. I don't love oppression. I don't love love, I love gender slander. And I just I just want to see people who have the equality that, that they that they deserve. The only thing about this I wanted to say, I mean, something that I think is interesting here is when I first saw this. So like Marshawn Lynch, for example, do we even know if it's a protest? Right. So like with Ben, we talked about this being characterized as a protest. And it seems from what he's saying is pretty fairly done as such. But is it even a protest? And the reason I ask that question is so. You don't stand for the national anthem. There's a certain expectation that you do, but I always feel like you got the right not to do it. Like, you don't even necessarily need an explanation for why it is that you don't do it. So I remember when I was a kid, um, when we moved to Texas, that was the first time I'd been anywhere where they did the Pledge of Allegiance. And I just, once I found out, like, what all the the word pledge meant in allegiance, I was like, hey, I don't know about this, right? As a young child, sensibilities. And I remember at one point I was standing for the Pledge of Allegiance, but I wouldn't say it because I just, like, the idea of rote ritual just didn't seem to go very far with me, right? I was a different kind of nine year old. Anyway, I remember I had a teacher come and talk to me about it, and I eventually, you know, went ahead and did the Pledge of Allegiance because it wasn't that big a deal. But I remember part of why I was like, okay, I don't really have to do this is there was another kid who did not say the Pledge of Allegiance. And he was a Jehovah's Witness. And the lady explained to me that it was okay that he did not say the Pledge of Allegiance because he was a Jehovah's Witness. And I was like, oh, wait a minute now, wait a minute, wait a minute, right? Even then, right, I caught something that was interesting, which is, so there are times where you find that it's okay to not pay homage to these symbols, right? It was okay in his case because it was in the name of some religious sort of allegiance. Now, that got me to thinking now about what's happening with Bennett, Marshawn Lynch, and all this, right? So Marshawn Lynch is never going to explain to you why it is that he's not standing for the national anthem because he doesn't do things like that, right? Like, he's never going to explain to you what it is. Since he's never going to explain it, I think people are ultimately going to get over it and let that thing ride, right? Because that made me think about what's going on with Kaepernick. 
Is the issue with Kaepernick even necessarily that he did not stand for the anthem, or is it specifically why he did not stand for the anthem? And see, to me, that's a very crucial distinction, because you have so many people who have made the whole, you know, disrespect to the military argument as though the military, like, owns the flag or something like that. Like, literally, like it is their own thing, right? Marshawn Lynch will do it, not stand for the anthem, and give you no explanation. And people have no option, really, other than to just let it go. Colin Kaepernick can tell you exactly what it is, and now all of a sudden we got people mad, and now you got people saying, is this the right kind of protest, or what else are you going to do other than protest? And then the man put all the money down, and then it became everything else, and so forth and so on. The strange moral of the story here is, if you have no reason for ignoring the national anthem, people are more okay with that than if your reason is, I feel like America needs to treat people better. All right now, I understand that my analysis here is somewhat crude, it's less than scientific, but I feel like we got enough there that at the very least that you got to ask that question, right? If you disregard the national anthem for no reason at all, does it go over better with people than if you do it with a pretty damn good cause? Think about what that means. 888-729-3776, that is our telephone number. Let's get the phone talk to Donald in Michigan. Donald, thanks for calling the right time. Hey, how we doing? First time calling. Thank you, man. Yeah, hey, you talk about dignity. We all have dignity, I hope. You know, we're, we're living in a time when I'm not really too sure. Dignity is a thing that people are understanding, but it's dignity and common sense. Now, you just touched on a little bit about Kaepernick and some of these other folks that are not standing up for the flag. And you, you had mentioned that um, that the military doesn't own the flag. No, but it's the land and the freedom and the opportunity. Now, I watch your show, and I really dig what you're doing, but, but you know, and this isn't to be an argument, but what it is is we all have our lives. You know, I don't like a lot of things, but I do them because it's the right thing to do. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to understand where you're at, and, uh, you know, we're not going to go to wars, but, you know, we got to look at the other side. Well, well the, hold on. The other, when you say the other side here, the other side of what? Those people that are that are protesting. Now, I don't know a lot about. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, buddy. Did you just tell me I got to look at the other side on neo Nazis? No, 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 no. I'm saying we, you and I, have to look at the other side. Say, like those white supremacists that was up there trying to protect some of these monuments that's been up there for generations. Now, generations, we're talking five, six hundred years ago, you and I were not even thought about. But the wars were fought, and I got it. It wasn't our land, brother. I know that. You know, I'm Mexican. I know about the Indian flight. I know about the Alaskan flight. I was there. I mean, over in Alaska for certain years. But that wasn't my war. That was not my battle. But what I know is these folks that are out there trying to protect something that I don't know anything about, but yet, there was something that spurred it. Some <sighs> dude from Ohio came through, and, and yeah, now we yeah, got where we're at. Dude, dude so, I gave you every chance I could for you to make sense, and it never happened. Uh, thank you for calling. Shannon, you did tell me I got to go to the other side on neo-Nazis, didn't he? Well, he was going, yeah. Okay, just making sure I wasn't crazy. Whew. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Our guest joined us on the Shell Penzo Performance Line. Just like our next guest, he covers the NFL for MMQB.com. He's got a column up right now that you can check out about national anthem protests and some of his thoughts on those things. His name is Robert Klemko. Now, Robert, I guess I'll start with, were you surprised to see Marshawn Lynch and Michael Bennett decide they weren't going to stand for the anthem? I figured that somebody would with Colin out of the league. I mean, it made sense that it was guys who were involved in the protests last year and who, you know, were in that big text message group that uh, a lot of NFL players who were interested had uh, last year. I actually thought that there would be more people doing it. I mean, it, it makes sense that Marsha and Michael are doing it because they're in such good financial situations, uh, in such good standing with the, the teams that they're on, that they have a lot of room to do it. Um, I, I guess I would have been shocked if it was a player that was in Colin's situation, you know, in the final year of a contract with a lot to prove. 
Now, one thing I think is interesting when you talk about it with uh, Michael Bennett, you know, Pete Carroll basically is like, hey, guys, say whatever it is that you want. There's no attempt to rein those guys in. But is that not an affront to the argument about distractions, about having somebody who takes such a stance? The, the fact that Carroll's able to do that? Yeah, the fact that it, they don't seem to be distracted, at least as far as I can tell. Yeah, I, I mean, you, you talk about the Seattle Seahawks and the New England Patriots, and they're at completely different ends of the spectrum. But the one thing that they have in common is that their success allows them to do things differently than everybody else. Um, Pete has chosen to tell all of his guys and to go and get guys who are open to doing this sorts of thing, who you know have this kind of uh, these kind of personal interests and are willing to express them. And I think sometimes that comes back to bite Pete and 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 the team in, in the butt. I mean, you look at what Seth Wickersham wrote for ESPN about these Seattle Seahawks um, and how it's been very difficult to get over that interception uh, at the goal line in the Super Bowl three years ago. Well, I think that's a, that's a byproduct of having a team with such strong personalities where guys are encouraged to express themselves. So there's, there's two sides to the coin. Most coaches would not put up with, uh, you know, players still harping on a play that happened two years ago in the Super Bowl, and most coaches would not – put up with players protesting the anthem. But I think Pete does because he knows that if he gives them that kind of freedom, he can have the most talented players and, and, and players that, um, you know, that when things are going really well, work really well together. All right, we're talking to Robert Klimko of MMQB.com here on The Right Time. So do you, why do you think so many people make this correlation between the protest of the national anthem and the disrespect of the military? That's one thing I don't understand. Um, but I do know that in, in 2001, just as a fan going to sporting events, between 2000 and 2001, I mean, a lot changed in the NFL with the celebration of the anthem. That's when you started to see the enormous American flag. That's when they started to man- march out representatives for all four branches of the military. That's when you started to see it on television more. And I think it was seen then as a celebration of our freedom from tyranny and, you know, uh, a tribute to the people who died uh, on 9-11 and the people currently fighting, um, you know, for their sacrifice uh, now uh, overseas. And so I I guess a lot of people then made that connection, but I really never have. I mean, I think the flag represents the 50 states that it stands for and, and, and the ideals that they were built on. And, and I admire Michael Bennett and, and, and um, Marshawn Lynch and Colin Kaepernick for not being willing to stand uh, while those ideals are being trampled on. Now, you wrote in your column, you said sports is supposed to be a relaxing escape, not a political, political exercise. You know, but that is an argument that is often made on the other side. What do you think when you hear people say that? I don't know. I, I think it's bull. I mean, I, I think it's the, when you buy a jersey – it doesn't give you so – you don't sign some sort of contract with the player that says that that player can never betray your political beliefs. You know, you're a fan of a team which is made up of 53 men, and you can't ask each of them to just leave politics out of their, their lives and, and not stand up for things they don't believe in just because, you know, they play a sport. I, I, I think what is at the root of that argument is this idea that these men are only good for sports. Uh, and that they were shepherded through high school and college and, and the pros, and they have no real perspective uh, on the world and, and politics. But I think it's just the opposite. I mean, I've talked to hundreds of NFL players and often come away, you know, with a new perspective on issues that have nothing to do with football. Um, a lot of these guys have lived all over the country. Um, they've gone from being the poorest of the poor to being – Uh, part of an elite group in a college, and they've seen their friends who have made that ascension get hurt and then get dropped right off off the bandwagon. Um, They're in a locker room with 53 guys, 90 at this point. They come from extremely diverse backgrounds. They work with these guys. They live with these guys. They learn to love a lot of these guys. So all the NFL players that I've talked to have had unique, um, you know, understanding of politics and culture in the United States, not a limited one. And, you know, I guess people, the, again, the divisive lock, locker room argument often comes up. You're around a lot of these locker rooms. Have you heard of any situation where an idea of politics has actually been something that could split up a football team? You know, I think during the Trump election, a lot of teams had to stop talking about it. And teams that might have had CNN on in the locker room um, definitely turned that off. 
I know the Broncos uh, had CNN on at, at some point in years past, and, and that wasn't the case last year. So uh, I think that there are teams and players that were really weary of, you know, specifically this election, tearing people apart. Um, but I don't know that it's ever translated into, you know, losses on the football field where you would have had wins. In the end, these guys have 16 opportunities every year um, to to get a job, to have a job the next year. None of the contracts are guaranteed. Um, so if you have any interest in, in maintaining uh, a career in the NFL, you know, you're not going to let petty political differences affect, you know, the way you perform on the field. All right, Dr. Robert Klimko of MMQB.com here on The Right Time. Now, you mentioned this text message group. I think for our listeners who are unaware of this, what is that text message group? So last year during the anthem protest, you know, when Kaepernick started doing it and other players were interested in doing it, they started a giant uh, text message group involving over 30 guys in the NFL, big names that you would have heard of. Um, And they were all um, essentially discussing what to do next. Um, And Kaepernick, you know, weighed in. uh, And I I can't remember which names have been reported, so I don't want to throw any names out there that uh, that weren't. But basically, these guys talked about the appropriate way to do it. And that's you remember that week last year um, when players all around the league either sat or kneeled or raised fists. That was the, kind of the culmination of that discussion. Well, how much did that continue through the season? I think it, I think it continued um, sporadically, but not the way that it, uh, not as intensely as it had been leading up to that. I think the players who started it were intended to uh, create a united front in, in specifically the way that they protested, and to a large degree, they were able to do that. Um, but I think as as players be- began to you know, finish their protests and, and, and start standing again for the national anthem, though Colin Kaepernick never did. Um, I think that that discussion slowed down. All right. That is Robert Klemko. Check him out at the MMQB.com covering the NFL. My man, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Okay, Kevin, for the grand prize of $1 million, what color is the White House? Um, I know this. I know this. I know this. Um, five seconds. Oh, Switching to GEICO could save you a bunch of money on car insurance? Okay. Judges? That's true, Kevin. They'll allow it. Congratulations. You're a winner. Woo! GEICO. Because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Ezekiel Elliott suspended six games. The NFL put out a memo. They made people accessible to talk about why it is that they decided that this would be the time that the minimum suspension for domestic violence, which was six games, would actually be enacted. I'm not sure Roger Goodell knows what the word minimum means. It's got three syllables. It's got three M's. I know having to say all those M's can be confusing for people. But now, yeah, this is the first time that the minimum has actually been applied. Elliot is going to appeal. Elliot's daddy got on the Twitter and made part of the case they're going to use in the appeal, including including that the alleged victim, and I guess I kind of still have to say alleged victim because this didn't go through in court, right? Don't want to get sued. Um, The alleged victim, according to Ezekiel Elliott's daddy, hit him up and said that no one would believe him and they would believe her because she was a white woman. This is where this thing has gone. Uh, Jerry Jones, we hear, is furious about what has happened. Now, what goes on next? I said, Ezekiel Elliott is going to put in an appeal. I think the appeal had to come down within three days of what had gone down. So the appeal is coming. And here's Adam Schefter on Mike and Mike saying what Zeke, what Zeke probably needs to do in order to get his uh, suspension reduced. I would just say that Zeke Elliott has a uphill battle here. I mean, it's possible that a game or two could be shaved off. We've seen it happen before. Other players have had certain appeals reduced, particularly if they're contrite. But as it's been explained to me, I don't think he's going to be contrite here. I think he's going to come in gloves off and try to take apart the NFL on the facts that it accumulated. I think that's the wrong approach because the league believes it has the evidence, and I know that Ezekiel Elliott, the Dallas Cowboys, they don't believe that the evidence is there. But it doesn't matter because the league believes it's seen enough, and the league makes the ruling, and the league makes the ruling upon appeal. So you're asking him to be contrite about something that he doesn't believe happened. And that's where this gets to be tricky, right? He says this did not happen. 
none of us really have any way of knowing whether or not it did. There is an accuser. She says this happened. The league believes that her story is the one that is true. They believe that Ezekiel Elliott is not telling the truth. I don't know. I can't say. I know the league says they have all these different people that they spoke to in the course of making this decision. They've come to where they are on this. This is what it is. Here's the thing, though. I've said this before. Credibility is like insurance. You don't need insurance till you need insurance. Right? Like you pay all that money every month for insurance. Most months, you never wind up needing that insurance. Mess around and let that bad boy lapse and see what happens. You're going to be out there on the side of the road talking about where is my insurance. That's how credibility is, and the NFL does not have credibility. On these matters, they have been so bad for so long that I cannot simply trust the NFL's word on this, even on a matter where we have asked the NFL to be more stringent. We've asked them to be more strident about these things. I have no idea if they're doing this right because they are not to be trusted. This is a point that Dominique Foxworth made on the Morning Roast this weekend. This is something that is difficult for me to uh, to speak to because you don't ever want to be – want to sound like you come down on the side of of Ezekiel Elliott or a player who's um, committed any acts of domestic violence. So we all agree that the things that he's accused of and the evidence that seems to support some of that is horrendous. But consistency is important. (laughs) And you can't just be out there throwing um, suspensions and fines and punishments around willy-nilly without any sort of consistency and i'm not here to argue that ezekiel shouldn't be punished or i'm not even here to say how long it should or shouldn't be i just believe it should be consistent and so for me i think it is fair to ask the nfl the question of why is it that josh brown gets the one game and then ezekiel elliott now gets the six by the same token i have the question of jerry jones Why, again, was it that you were so sure that there was nothing? Because the NFL seems pretty damn sure that there is a lot. I don't have anybody here that I feel like I should believe on the strength of their word. I don't feel like I have either of them on either side that I should simply believe on the strength of their word. I don't have it. So I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do with this punishment. I have no idea how I'm supposed to tell if it is or is not fair. Because the only person that I got to ride with on this right now is either the guy accused of domestic violence or the NFL that has handled this poorly so many different times. All that being said, while I do have the questions about the credibility on the side of the NFL, I'll say this about Ezekiel Elliott. If you are lying, you are a lowlife. Period. Like, if you are lying and you are going to push this lie that far and you got your daddy out here lying for you, you got Jerry Jones out here carrying your story, if you are a li- if you are lying, you are the lowest of low lives. There's no way around this. Like, the suspension here has come, and I understand that it might be really, really difficult if you've committed such an act to come in front of everybody and say, I committed that act. But that's the place where you start getting the redemption on this sort of thing and people start buying into you again. Like if Ray Rice had still played in the NFL, if he had gotten another chance at the NFL, we would hold Ray Rice up as an example of how it is that you're supposed to handle these things. And I feel like if Ray Rice had gotten into the league, these dudes that get out here and make these mistakes would be far more likely to own them and face up to them because they would have this example of a dude who was showing you, you've made this mistake, well, now you got to go out here and get this right. And then after you get this right, all the things that you feared about telling the truth, You'll have nothing to fear after that. If you did this, man, you got to own it. And if this goes to some level of appeal and we get more and more reporting that comes out of this that winds up making you look worse, you know how much money you're going to cost yourself down the line? Like, do you realize how much? And you're like, money is not the biggest thing. No, it is absolutely not the biggest thing in the world. But I can't figure out any other reason there is for him to carry this lie if it is a lie. So, yeah, because of the NFL and their lack of credibility, I am willing to entertain the possibility somewhat that he might be telling the truth. I am willing to do that. I don't really apologize for that because I feel like the NFL has put me in that situation. But if he is lying about this and not just lying, but lying and got all these other people carrying his water as he tells this lie. Then I can't think of it's hard to think of people who are much farther down than that, right, who are less worthy of our basic respect than that. I would also like to note, by the way, whether or not Z committed that act of domestic violence, 
He absolutely should have been suspended for taking that woman's top off at the parade. Now, I'm not saying that necessarily should have been a six-game suspension, but he absolutely should have been suspended for that, even if you're talking about one game. Because if the NFL is talking about violence against women, that was one of those, right? And I think that's the one that if you really, really, really want to, like, show something to the players in the league, you probably do more by coming down on that one than you would on the alleged act of domestic violence, which is not to say that the act at the St. Patrick's Day parade is the same as what he is accused of in Columbus. No. What I am saying, though, is that thing of that St. Patrick's Day parade is something that far more young guys are likely to actually engage in, right? Like a lot of dudes who think themselves as good dudes are far more likely to engage in that one because it's real easy, especially for young dudes, mess around, Get out there drinking with these girls. They out there grooving. You start feeling comfortable. You think that you're the man, and you try this one time, and she slaps your hand away, and you think it's no big deal, and then you try it again. It was a big deal the first time, too. Like, that's, that is a place where we see people make mistakes at events like that every day. And, I mean, I, mistake is not the right word to understand. I'm not sure what the best way is to put it, but I think you know what I'm talking about. And it's real easy in this society to be a young dude and think that kind of behavior is okay. Real, real, real easy because when guys do get caught up doing something like that, we go talk to them and we say, hey, man, you shouldn't have done that. But it's nothing that really comes down there. Like There's nothing that actually happens to them when something like that goes down. But that's bad, man. Like, that is a problem. It's not just simply a, like a violation of personal space or something like that. That is legitimately an assault. And this dude on camera, on, like, you can't do that. So even if he did not do what they said he did in Columbus, I think he did something that was worthy of being suspended. I absolutely do believe that. I got no back down on the fact that I think that he should be suspended on that. What I hate more than anything else, though, is that the body that we are trusting to enforce on these measures is one I absolutely cannot trust. I can't. So Zeke Elliott might have done something horrible. There is reason to believe that he did something horrible. I mean, you have to raise the fair question. Where did the woman get the bruises from that she sent the pictures of? Right? Where did that happen if it was not from Zeke? So there's a good chance he did something horrible. But right now, the only person's word I got to rock with on that is Raj and a woman who accused him and who acknowledged telling some lies in the course of this. And that acknowledgement comes from the NFL. They acknowledged that she told some lies in the course of this. So, no, I have no idea who it is that I'm supposed to believe. And I blame the NFL for that because I'm supposed to be able to trust you. I don't expect to be able to trust Zeke on this matter. I'm supposed to be able to trust you because you're the body that we deal with consistently. We're supposed to be able to trust you. We're supposed to be able to trust you, your processes, and the man that's at the front of this operation. And I don't trust any of them. And this is on something that you say as a league is very, very important to you. Just explain to me how this one was six and the others were not. Just let me know. And if you're on Zeke's side, if we find out that y'all are lying, go away, never come back. That goes for Zeke, that goes for Jerry, and anybody else that's carrying his story. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. We were just talking about what's going on here with Zeke. Let's hit the phone. Let's talk to Brent in Georgia. Brent, what's going on? How you doing, man? Doing all right, man. Man, it's so good to hear from you. I kind of have a problem with this um, suspension because if I'm to believe what's going on now, the NFL suspends him for six games. Now, Ezekiel Elliott, I don't know if he did it or not, but the fact is the police didn't find enough evidence to charge him. I'm not saying I'm on his side, but when you have people who've actually been charged with things, convicted of things, and they only get one or two games, and this is the leg that you choose to stand on with Ezekiel Elliott when the police said there's no evidence. You look stupid. No, I think you're right. And see, this is where it gets tricky. And Brent, I appreciate the call. Where this gets tricky for the league is I do not generally buy the argument that, well, the court said that nothing happened. We asked for the NFL to do more on top of the courts, in part because we understand the limitations of the court system in matters such as these, right? People demanded more than the legal standard, right? Uh, you know who else never been, yeah, it was name? Pac Man Jones never got convicted of anything, as I recall, right? That's where we were, right? We asked for the league to do more. But on this one, right, where guys wound up facing charges and the likes, and then the NFL gave them lesser suspensions, and then Zeke got six. Why? Like, I think it's fair for all of us to get into a place where we are asking, why was this it? And I don't really feel like the answer as of now has been satisfactory. But that's what happens when you don't have credibility. 
All right, 888-729-3776. Let's go to Scott. Scott, thanks for calling the right time. Hey, man. How are you, How man? How you doing? Doing all right. No, just, I, I think there's something else behind this because – She's showing she's got her evidence, but now if he says he didn't do it, where's his evidence at? And if he had someone there that's seen it for him, then why won't they, why won't they stand up for him? Instead of letting him do this, you know, instead of having his dad come out and everybody else come out for him. Now, I think that that's a fair one, and I appreciate the call. The only tricky thing is how do you affirm a negative, right? Like, how do you prove you did not do something? I don't have an answer for you on what you're supposed to do. But I do think this, on his end, he's going to need to come with more than he's got if he's going to come out here on the I Didn't Do It program. Because uh, what my man Bill Withers say, don't do too much good to be talking, brother, when ain't nobody listening. All right, 888-729-3776. That is our telephone number. We talked a little bit about what was going on in Charlottesville. Uh, Chris and Kyle Long, uh, the Scions. Is that the right word? Isn't Scion, isn't the word, Shannon? When they sons. Scion. That's not right. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. hit the dictionary for me on that. Uh, anyway, they're Howie Long's kids. Um, over the weekend, before the pre- Eagles preseason game, Chris Long has something to say about what's going on in Charlottesville, which is those two young men's hometown. Here's what he had to say. People can have the worst opinion in the world, but, you know, America's founded on giving the opportunity for free speech. But, you know, I do think it's despicable. Um, and at the same time, it's hard not to get angry. I don't know if that's what the point of those rallies is to piss everybody off, but um, certainly you see it and you're just angry. Sion was correct, by the way. Sion, that was correct. Now, uh, here's his brother Kyle talking about it doesn't really matter where these things happen. It's just all bad. Regardless of where it's happening, uh, you know, injustice in the world we live in is in any place is injustice to humanity, and it's a threat to the freedoms we have. Obviously, it's a small percentage of people involved uh, who are blatantly in the wrong, and we need to do our best as good folks and, you know, continue to outnumber and express our opinions and act accordingly uh, when given the opportunity to. Now, you know, my man talked about what we can do as good folks in this one. This is something I want the NFL to consider, like just as a thought. And I am not necessarily equating um, what happened in Charlottesville and the views that those to which those people subscribe to, like everyone who disagrees with this whole Kaepernick, you know, what he's done. I'm not equating that necessarily. However, I feel like this league repeatedly has demonstrated that they are more concerned with hurting the feelings of those who are not quite as bothered by Charlottesville and the rest of us at the expense of others. And I think it's a fair point to wind up making. So, like, let me give you an example here. And, like, it kind of ties into this network, but it's whatever, right? Um, Hank Williams Jr. is coming back, right? Hank Williams Jr. will be back doing the Monday Night Football song. And I told you about this before. I went on TV once and we were supposed to – talk about it, and I was really mad because I was going to get my criticized ESPN on, and then Dave Zyron and Paul Feinbaum wound up having an argument that involved the Holocaust, and I didn't really feel like that was the place uh, for me to participate um, when that happened. But Hank Williams Jr.'s whole career is wrapped up in that Confederate flag. Last time I checked, you can go to Hank Williams Jr.'s website, and you can get a shirt with his face right in the middle of the stars and bars. It's the same stars and bars that you saw people flying at that at that rally on Saturday. The same one, right? Now, I find all things associated with the stars and bars to be offensive, right? Like, I mean, and I don't think there's any way for me to view it other than to be offended by it. But ain't nobody worried about offending me. Nobody's worried about offending me at all, right? Like, they're not. They're not. With Kaepernick, the argument that so many people make is like, oh, we had John Mara say this. Like, yeah, we got so many phone calls with so many people who did not want him here. And I'm like, yo, why is it that you don't want him here, number one? But number two, you tell me it's the only time anybody ever calls you? Like, you think it's the only time anybody's ever mad at you or anything? Like, why are you so concerned with those people being mad or those people having their feelings hurt. And so, like, I watched the thing that went on in Charlottesville, and what was crazy to me is, like, honestly, the level of respect that was supposedly shown to the fact that these guys get to express how they feel. No matter how vitriolic it is, what they feel is, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how poisonous how they, what they feel is. 
is a lot more concerned with those guys having their right to express how they feel than it is going in the other direction. And, look, I'm one of those people that says, hey, you kind of got to let them march. You can't let them run cars into people, but you kind of got to let them say whatever their piece is. I don't feel like them folks are saying the same thing on the other side, and I feel like when it comes down to it, whose feelings are people more worried about hurting? The people that's out here doing that or the people who are offended by the way that Colin Kaepernick is treated. J.D. Power did a survey asking fans who watched less of the NFL why it was, and I think the percentage was something like 26% of Colin Kaepernick, but it was ultimately like 200 people in that whole poll who said that Kaepernick was the reason they watched less of the NFL. We did a poll on the ESPN radio account where people were mad that we even asked the question as to whether or not people would blackball the N- I mean, would boycott the NFL over Colin Kaepernick. We had more people in that poll say that they would consider that than we had people say anything in that J.D. Power poll. But ain't nobody worried about hurting their feelings, not even a little bit. We don't have to entertain everybody's views. Their right to express them, certainly. Their views... Not so much. Just an hour ago, I had a Mexican dude telling me that I had to see the side of the neo-Nazis. The hell is wrong with us, man? The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Joining me here is my man, Pablo Torre. You ain't, you ain't over there looking at notes, are you? No. Whoa, whoa, to Pablo, you have to turn your microphone on. There we go. So the sad reality is that I did write myself a note on the way to this show. I prepared a little, not, not prepared, I just had a thought. And I wrote it down because my notes app on my phone is a junk drawer of 2,000 notes. But the note says, this is my note to myself, when it comes to free speech, society should play prevent defense. Do tell. So like I realized we're talking a lot about free speech these days, and we never really established where the limits are. So this notion that a Nazi rally can occur in a town raises the question of when does the state, when do people intervene and say, we need to prevent this from happening? Right. And there's limits, right? Like fire in a, fire in a crowded theater, for example. Yes, 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 yes. But mostly, like, I just, I don't want to play cover two, right? Like college campuses, the short gain stuff, really, that's fine. Like college campuses can be weird laboratories of thought, and that's okay. I'm not going to play cover two. But we just got to recognize when the bomb is coming, right? Like, when is the long (laughs) pass coming? Because all we're doing is playing prevent defense. I'm cool. Again, I'm cool with campuses doing their own thing. I'm not saying we got to highly regulate every little riff on the Internet or in the university space. But when it comes to the Nazi rally, it's like, yeah, okay, here's the the thing we've been built (laughs) to defend. And if we don't defend it, that's just a phenomenal failure, of course, but more to the point, it's insulting when anyone tries it, and it should be insulting. And that felt like a long pass that we were just somehow caught off guard by. <laughs> <laughs> like, wait a minute, guys. We've been talking about this. This is the play. Stop this one. <laughs> well, here, here's the problem where I think it gets to be interesting on this one, because I will vehemently deny it. Like I saw something where someone resigned their position from the ACLU because the ACLU is defending the right of, of the course, Nazis of to do this. And I am on the side of the ACLU on that one because I'm big on process, right? Like I'm totally big on sure. you have to be able to allow them. The question is, can you have the Nazi rally without the dude in the car running over people Correct. and without people getting beaten with sticks? Right. And so it becomes an interesting theoretical notion once it's placed there into that level of application. Like, can you have that? Because I feel like when the non-police show up with riot gear, oh, buddy, I'm not sure what we're supposed to do now. Right. Like, here's the football. It's whistling through the air. We see it all coming. And 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 the other thing, really, though, about, uh, you know, what should we do here? I mean, I feel like when you allow society, right, to be governed by a contract that doubles not just as a contract, but as a suicide pact, <laughs> like, whoa, 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 like the groups that we need to classify as the long bomb, like 50 yard Randy must touch Randy Moss touchdown people. Like, you know, we're not asking for a whole ton there. 
Well, really not. Well, I think on this one, as Randy Moss would be there, we're talking to Pablo Torre of ESPN the Magazine. You got to call pass interference, right? And, and, <laughs> and, that, and that, that that seemed to be the issue here more than anything else. Is like, wait a minute, we you, you're not going to call pass interference here because when cops are watching, right? Like the dude said, the cop, he was getting beat up next door to the police station. That right there is, hey man, you guys got to call the push off. You, you, you put two hands in the back. That's what it has got to be. Now let's take this to a sports thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like we're going to hear more from athletes about this one just because I think you're going to hear from more from more people on this one. Like I saw the Michael Bennett and Marshawn Lynch. There's no, I I can never explain Marshawn Lynch. So I do not try. Right. Michael Bennett, however, gives you a little bit more of an explanation. You got to wonder as more and more of this happens, our friends who like to stick to sports and I understand why they would like to stick to sports, but our friends who like to stick to sports, is that even going to be an option as this proceeds? Well, this is this is the whole argument, and you brought up the ACLU earlier very appropriately because this is a lot about what it means to have diversity of ideas and diversity of opinion, right? And, like, what are we obligated to speak out against? And so the idea that more and more athletes would see the – again, I'm torturing this metaphor literally to death, but they would see the one thing, right? This is like the stuff that straight up Captain America's comic book legend is based in, right? Like – the Nazi stuff, right? Like the idea that, okay, now we're going to get more people in the pool on this. That's totally understandable. But, you know, again, if your understanding of a social contract, right, the thing that we all live under and agree with, the thing we're defending ultimately, if you think that that also extends identically to people whose goal is to destroy said social contract, then it becomes the interesting suicide pact concept, right? Yeah. And, and there's, this is a real huge argument that the ACLU will vehemently, I'm sure, disagree with me about. And I get why. I'm just saying if we're going to recognize the stakes in a realistic way, we have to realize that a civil society is a civil society because it condemns roundly. I'm not even necessarily saying get a ban this speech. I'm just saying the response to be so uniformly robust as to indicate yeah look you can't no 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 that just has to be the response yeah and i see what was interesting that was wild about what happened over the weekend was i was at the national association of black journalists convention right right? so i wasn't really doing much work like i wasn't paying too much attention so i was aware that something was going on here and so the thing that struck me about it and i talked about this on the radio was the fearlessness of it all like the idea that you're gonna show up here no mask right face out world to see crazy like it's crazy boom, like boom i got in a car to come down here and get down with this program and then it turns into what it did turn into by the time it was over it's like yo man once this gets to be the no mask world we got a lot that's going on here we've got a whole lot that is going on so then i saw somebody had died like that's before i'd even gotten to the point where i'd seen that someone got hit by a car and then the dude backs up and goes again and part of what was wild to me is everybody saw this one coming like the stories that are going on like there's been a couple of those he was a loner story but it's been a whole lot more like yeah he's been talking this nazi stuff forever i'm like forever this only came back in style a couple years ago i thought forever ever forever forever ever yes but this is this is that concept, right? The Overton window, which is a thing I think about a lot lately because it's a very it's a very academic term for something. Really, a guy, really a very academic term. I know it's it's I defy <laughs> type sometimes. But but the Overton window was discovered by or thought about by this guy whose last name was Overton, and it was the range of things that society deems acceptable, right? And and there's a great there's a great list of descriptions for what those different tiers are. So if you think about, for instance, you know, the terror alert color coding list, there's an equivalent one for just like what is okay or should be considered okay. And it goes from the most free, unthinkable, and this is going in reverse order, unthinkable, radical, acceptable, sensible, popular policy. Unthinkable, radical, acceptable, sensible, popular. You'll notice that we went from radical to acceptable (laughs) real quick (laughs) right like this stuff happens like this right the gradations between not okay and radical and acceptable are adjacent to each other they're adjacent to each other And, and so the concept of of something like this escalating so quickly this is why we have to be vigilant about speech and this is why I'm saying, like, we got to play this prevent defense because we can't just let stuff go by because it affects 
where our Overton window, so to speak, lies across thought. Yeah. And it's dangerous. Yeah. It's just dangerous. We'll give it to you short. We're not giving it to you deep. By the way, this is a fascinating illustration of where, like, the difference between me and Pablo will come up on our television show that debuts January 2nd, 2018, as Pablo has his meticulous notes as he is ready for this, and I'm over here playing a puzzle. <laughs> it's so much less <laughs> meticulous than people think is the crazy, fraudulent part of this. Yeah, just throwing his stuff out there. Just throwing it it's out there. It's good for my brand, though. I think so. I think it works well. It's a nice bod here. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. My man Pablo Torre hanging out with me for a little while. Right Time is brought to you by Upside. Now say big on traveling. Get a big gift card every trip you buy. You'll love Upside.com. Upside.com. All right, 888-729-3776. That is our telephone number. Uh, so apparently, coming across the, the news desk here, we found out what all was in Tiger Woods' system. Um, hydrocodone, which is uh, the Vicodin. Mm-hmm. Uh, hydromorphone. Which is Dilaudid. Oh, Dil. Wait, oh. is that is that Dilaudid? D i l a u d i d. I don't know. I would assume you don't know the the band, the Mountain Goats, but they have a song, I believe, that's about this. It oh. is so that it, it's of a wavelength that is extreme. Yeah, and I believe it's kind of one of those tranquilized. Oh, well, hold on, I'm not done. Um, Al Prazalam, which is Xanax. Um. Zolpedum, which is Ambien, and Delta 9 Carboxy THC, which is the active ingredient in marijuana. And I feel like I see this and I have two thoughts. Thought number one is, yo, I hope he gets it under control, right? Like, I mean, there seems to be a lot going on there. I hope he gets it under control. Yes. Number two, didn't see that one coming. Like. Did you see that coming? Because I didn't see that one coming. I, I, I didn't. I feel like maybe his, I don't know, like is does does the sunglasses he likes to wear those like goggle ones? Do they do, should that have been a warning sign or not? It's a good question, but I di- did not see that. Didn't one see it coming, coming either. No, not at all. No, not no, all. no. Did not. Did not. Um, and we want to be clear: we don't know if he had prescriptions, and that medical marijuana is legal in Florida. But again, did not see that coming. Like, Tiger is, like, but this all kind of fits into the story of Tiger Woods as a guy who is trying to numb himself. Yes. That seems to be the unifying characteristic of that long and multisyllabic list that you just read. Yes, yes, it is. It is. He's in pain. It is. Is what it seems like. It is. Much to my surprise, that is the part that you are focusing on, as I keep going back to did not see that coming. Did not. I also love ESPN. Like how, how did he? How did he? How did he consume it? Do we think it's a fair question to ask? Right? It is a. It is a very, very, very fair question to ask. Um, what are his means of acquisition on all of these things? And, and shout out to ESPN, by the way, for running through because they got the scientific names for all of these things, and they even put in like I, I think somebody at the desk was like, okay, we have to explain his hydrocodone because you just you know don't want to give away Viking and you know like there's all kinds. You got to explain his hydromorphone, and then they get to the weed, and they're like. All right, put that down there, too. And it's Delta 9 Carboxy THC. But they put THC as initials because whoever was typing that list of all them long names is like, look, I ain't writing all that out. <laughs> you know, like, I'm not. I am not. They get it. Yeah, they yeah. They get it. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not writing all that out at all. But, yeah, dude, I, I hope my man gets it straight. Like, that's, that's just, I guess whenever people get busted for DUIs, I don't really moralize on DUI in the way that other people do in large part because I'm like, okay, so what you're telling me is, You have consumed this substance that impairs your judgment, and then you did something that was a bad idea. I I see how it happens, right? Like, yes, you should certainly be more responsible, but I don't I don't stand on my chair about that one in the ways that I feel like a lot of other people do. Like I just I just don't. So often when I see this, I'm like, man, I just hope you're all right. And with Tiger, I'm like, it seems pretty clear that you are not all right. Because there is some standing on a chair to do here if we wanted to do it, and I don't think we necessarily should, because I don't think right now people are, like, dying for the take that says marijuana is very, very different than alcohol in terms of driving impairment as a concept, right. for instance. I don't think people want to hear that right now because especially it is mixed in, in this case, in a cocktail of other yes. very dangerous things. But, yeah, I mean, this is this is 
this is a, a gradation of seriousness. Yes. Well, I think it also, to a degree, I think when people see stuff like this, this is the moment when you realize that a lot of the hand-wringing about marijuana is way overwrought, right? Because I run through all of these things, and I tell you that he's dealing with the one that's not that we're not looking at is the big problem is the one that is the least legal, right? Like the other ones are the ones that have us like, whoa, man, I hope you're doing okay. Mm -hmm. The last one was like, let me find out. (laughs) That's right. Yep, yep, that's about how it is. Would you like to talk to America? I would would love nothing more. All right. 888-729-3776. That's our telephone number. Let's hit the phone. Something James in Virginia. James, thanks for calling the right time. Hey, thank you for taking my call, gentlemen. Happy Monday, guys. You too, and I, man. I, I will touch on that Tiger Woods thing, too, man. I, that kind of threw me for a loop as well. Even like, like you said, man, I hope he gets it together because those things are real deal. But the reason, the main reason I'm calling for you, gentlemen, is I want to say thank you, man. I want to say thank you guys for touching in on real hard subjects. You know, nothing in this world, nothing in this country will ever change until people sit down and have real conversation about racism. And I know this is a sports show, so you can only go but so far. But, again, let me say thank you. Hope you guys have a wonderful evening. And, D, I, I vibe with you, man. You, you bring me back to the, to the old times, man, when I was growing up. Have hey, a great evening, guys. Help for the rest of you. I, I appreciate it, man, although he did tell us to um... – like keep talking about racism and then said hail to the Redskins on the way out the door, which kind of like. But I appreciate I, I appreciate yeah, yeah, his yeah. compliment that came before yeah, I, that. I do, I do, but I do. We, we do kind of have to note that that does kind of like but this, fly but in the, the face of some of the stuff that came. But that kind of like right, it, it unintentionally adds to his point without realizing it. Because one of the things we do sh- need to do really is like figure out a way f- to find out like what a lot of people like what a super majority of people in this country actually agree on. Yes. Like, let's just create one of those, like an actual terms of service, you know? Like, let's just start to figure out what we all agree on. Because I think we don't know. I don't think we know what <laughs> we actually agree on, even the most basic stuff yeah, I think, about Nazism. Yeah, I think that's fair to say that we don't know what everyone agrees on. But sometimes you just get out there and you realize that there are common things between people, even if the common things wind up being unspoken, right? And they're the things that go across the society. Like uh, my man, Jimmy Israel, uh, used to recommend to me, he's like, you got to find the beat, right? Like where's the beat that you can ride and that you get in everybody else can kind of find the groove. And every now and then things happen and you get to a place where you can look at what's going on and you're like, okay, this is the beat, right? Like this is the common thing that goes across to all people. And I feel like one of those times was, we ran through that list and we got to this THC with Tiger Woods, <laughs> right? Like I feel like, every, I feel like everybody saw that one detail and they were like, Huh. See, that's that. See, that's the common beat that people have right in front of them all the time, and they completely ignore it. And not saying those things as you see them is part of what is tearing us apart. Wow. Wow. I think that was deep. First off, shout out to Jimmy Israel. I've been to his, his studio in Cleveland. Really? Yes. He and I used to do this show, The Barbershop on NPR. The oh, yeah, okay, I remember departed. that. Yeah. But Jimmy Israel, yes. I wish he was sitting here with us, actually. That would be an awesome conversation. The, 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 the last thing I expected in mentioning Jimmy Israel here was Pablo being like, I've been to Jimmy's house. <laughs> not his house, his studio. Even, all the same. The last thing <laughs> yes, I expected. Yes. His, one of his residences. Thanks for listening to The Right Time Podcast. Please come back tomorrow for more. And don't forget to listen to The Right Time with Boma 